Okay. Hello and good afternoon and welcome to the afternoon session. Um, this afternoon's panel is on racial and diasporic imaginaries, and we have um, three, four presenters actually. Um, and I'm going to um, just really stick to time and um, present Azil Kutsia and Bibi Berger to get us going. And um, yeah, like I said, in the interest of time, I won't say very much so that we have 15, mi 15 minutes at the end of the session to ask all our panelists um, some questions or engage them with comments. Um, and we're very much looking forward to this. Thank you all for being here. Azil, over to you. Hi, Dee. Thanks. So just to check how much time do I have then now? Okay. So you have 15 minutes um, and then I'll just introduce the next um, speaker and yeah and then at the end we'll have 15 minutes again and um, you're all welcome to put comments or questions in the chat and I can kind of facilitate that um, once everyone's presented. Okay let me just share my screen. Um... Okay, can you all see that? Yes, we can. Um, Thank you. So I am presenting on myself, uh, for myself and also on behalf of Dr. Bibi Berger, who cannot be here today. Um, and we will be, I will be talking about the intersectional poetry of Rinalda S. Comfort as corrective to the race logic of white Afrikaans literary feminisms. In her four acclaimed books of poetry, South African poet Rinaldo Comfort develops a nuanced, original, in many ways radical and beautifully crafted intersectional feminist critique of South African society, exploring issues of sexual violence, kinship, land, motherhood, coloniality and race, among many other things. The catch is that she writes in Afrikaans and therefore finds herself in a cultural and literary space that is proving to be particularly resistant to feminist influence and critique a literature that continues to center the voice and experience of the white man. In this article, we explore the meaning and implications of the emergence of comfort voice in a literary system that is historically profoundly invested in her exclusion as brown woman and the potential effects of her intersectional feminist poetry in a canon beholden to white patriarchy. We argue that through her refusal to understand heterosexualist patriarchy as an ahistorical framework and her commitment to portraying the deep and complex imbrication of race in the gendering of subjects in South Africa, Comfort's work presents an opening for a literary feminist consciousness that offers real emancipatory possibilities. Comfort's poetry enables an understanding of the self in relation in ways that subvert and destabilize the boundary keeping technologies that structure the production of Afrikaans literature and hegemonic cultural life. So uh, before I go over into a bit of a close reading of Comfort's poetry, I will um, set up the context in which she is writing. The inception of white Afrikaner identity happened relatively recently. And although it is known to present itself as something natural or inevitable, it is, like all identities, the opposite of that. In the beginning of the 20th century, the Afrikaner folk as a racial ethnic people quite literally invented itself. Afrikaner nationalism arose from the debris of the South African war in which the British defeated the Boer states in their pursuit to gain control over African land and labor. For purposes of retaining power in the emerging capitalist state built on a newly established mining industry, the traditional settler farmers from Dutch and other European descent who were disunited and scattered across vast distances had to forge a sense of collective unity Unity, culture, and purpose. This was not only a profoundly racist project, but also a patriarchal one from the outset, shaped and determined by the gender norms and hierarchies that are known to structure nationalisms. In the South African colony, the Afrikaner becomes white through the rigid enforcement of a hierarchical, binary, and compulsory heterosexual and procreative gender system with a specific division of labor in which women are tasked with maintaining and purifying the symbolic boundaries of the folk. This can be seen in the way in which hegemonic Afrikaner identity is centered on an ideology of compulsory heterosexual motherhood and domestic containment articulated with reference to the trope of the folksmuller, the mother of the nation. 
the vehement guarding of the white woman's sexuality against the perceived threat of black male carnality and the apartheid regime's obsessive policing of white women's reproduction, among many other things. To complicate things further, the racial and gender elements of Afrikaner nationalism are also tightly interwoven with class. In a colonial setting where whiteness required wealth and vice versa, the movement of Afrikaner nationalism that culminated in the official institution of the apartheid policy in 1948 was powered by a relentless pursuit to uplift Afrikaners to middle class status in the capitalist economy. Race, gender and class were therefore inseparable in the forging of Afrikaner identity. In her subjugation and domestic containment, the white Afrikaner woman bears the symbolic and existential burden of maintaining the racial unity of her people and the coherence of its colonial identity. The emancipation of the Afrikaner woman in this order constitutes nothing less than a threat to the ethnic survival and material privilege of her people. It is therefore no surprise that the culture does not easily produce feminism, and much less so feminism interested in thinking and working intersectionally across categories of gender, race, and class. Even if Afrikaner nationalism as a movement and ideology was distinctly patriarchal in nature, Afrikaner women were not, were not simply passive receptors of politics, and their role was not purely supportive and domestic. By taking part in the shaping of the folks' mother identity and exercising agency in the realm of the household, Afrikaner women willfully played a crucial role in the construction of the white Afrikaner as self-ethnic, self-conscious ethnic and class group. Literature and language were instrumentalized in pivotal ways in the creation of the Afrikaner folk after the South African War. At this point, the war-torn Dutch speakers did not have as much as a language in common, but spoke a medley of high Dutch and local dialects with smatterings of the slave and guni and Khoisan language, Khoisan language is scorned as Kumbai style of house servant slaves and women. The nationalist project of inventing of Afrikanerdom as ethnic identity was founded in an elaborate labor of purging or purifying this Kumbai style of its indigenous rural associations and instituting it as a mother tongue of the Afrikaans people. So again, it's no surprise that Afrikaans literature as a literary tradition, which has many canonized writers, has no pronounced feminist tradition. And there are exclusion here. We see some uh, Afrikaans feminist writers. There are exceptions here. We see some uh, white Afrikaans feminist writers, uh, but generally, uh, their work does not go across the intersections of race and class, although um, Marlene van der Kerk in front um, did work very well across class. But um, generally, the uh, iterations of feminism in this literary canon uh, is not intersectional and is not common. So historically, Afrikaans literature functions in service of the development and maintenance of a middle-class Afrikaner whiteness that justifies and naturalizes its oppressive existence through a mythologized patrilineal relationship to land. It is a literary tradition primed towards the cause of an identity project that depends on the hardening of boundaries, the deepening of binaries, and the vehement avoidance of thinking across categories. It's a liter literature from which the middle-class man emerges as subject par excellence that exists against the foil of gender, class, and racial others, who's, uh, and their otherness are established with reference to the neutral standard of white middle-class masculinity. In this tradition, the voice of the Black woman emerges with great difficulty. The first Afrikaans book published by a Black or Brown woman, the Story van Monica Peters by E.K.M. Dido, was published only as late as 1996. In this tradition, a brown woman writer like Comfort, who insists on thinking gender, race, and class hierarchies together, represents nothing less than a threat to the structuring logic of the canon. In the rest of this article, we explore the potential that Comfort's challenge to the Afrikaans literary canon holds for intersectional feminist emancipation in the cultural and literary space of Afrikaans. From the very first poem in Rinaldo Kampfer's first collection, Now That Slop and the Wonder, Now That Sleeping Dogs, in 2008, she has been concerned with her position as a brown woman writing, writing, writer writing in a language and literary system built on the tenets of white supremacy and the negation of black voices. She says, uh, and all the poems that I will be reading here, um, we translated ourselves from the Afrikaans. It's originally written in Afrikaans. 
Now I'm sitting round a table with my forefathers' enemies. I nod and greet politely, but somewhere deep inside myself, I know where I stand. It is clear that the speaker in this poem views her position within the Afrikaans literary system as marginal. marginal. In idiomatic terms, she is invited to take a seat at the table, but she knows that underlying this invitation is a fundamental rift between herself and her forefathers' enemies, with which she means the white establishment. Comfort explains that this poem deals with her, and I quote, she says, awareness of the fact that I was a token colored invited to poetry events and festivals in order to remind Afrikaans speaking white people that they were inclusive and not racist. This sentiment is elaborated on and more explicitly linked with whiteness's co-option of the Afrikaans language and the speaker's hostility towards white Afrikaans men in particular in a poem later in the same um, compilation entitled Vergewe mij maar ek is Afrikaans. Forgive me, but I am Afrikaans. She writes, I speak your language, I eat your food, I live in your fatherland, I drink your wine, I sing your music, and dear uncles, I, yes I, I make out with your sons. Comfort's taunting reminder to the white man that she has sexual relations, relations with their sons cuts to the core of the racial anxieties that shaped the apartheid order. The apartheid regime was obsessed with the prohibition of interracial sex because of the disastrous consequences it has for racial purity, white male dominance, segregation, and the idea of white lineage. From the outset, Comfort therefore understands and addresses the exclusion of her black voice also as a gendered exclusion and presents the racial threat that her literary voice implies to the tradition in terms of the crisis that her gendered body poses to the white lineage and its racialized claim to land privilege and power. Comfort is addressing the white patriarch and she is doing so as a brown woman fully aware that it is in the intersection of her race and gender that the full force and meaning of her poetic debut in the Afrikaans language lies. The effect of Comfort's voice in the literary system is ambiguous. On the one hand, it is, it is difficult not to conclude that Comfort's accession into the space has created rupture that allows others to enter. This can be seen in the fact that since Comfort published her first book in 2008, various poets of color made their debuts in Afrikaans. On the other hand, and at the same time, Comfort recognizes her canonization as a form of tokenization, an inclusion that allows the Afrikaans literary establishment to think of itself as open and non-racist without committing to structural transformation. Comfort is welcomed into the fold of the Afrikaans literary establishment, and she wins a lot of very big and prestigious prizes in this establishment. Um, and she sees this, uh, she speaks about this, um, understanding it as, She's not a standard that fits into the, the canon, but because of the very fact of her difference. Her inclusion allows the establishment to imagine itself as heterogeneous, to claim her difference as our differences. Comfort's reflection on her position vis-a-vis -vis Afrikaans literature in general continues in her other collections. Azil, Azil, sorry to interrupt you. You have two minutes. Two minutes. Ah, OK. Yeah. Let me quickly just go through um, Okay, so we'll buy her um, latest um, collection. She says, I don't want a place at the Women's Enfranchisement Act table, which was set in 1930 for white women only. Keep your table. We are making a fire outside. There with fire, we see the um, associations with insurrection. She also quotes James Baldwin as a motto for the um, for the collection in which he also talks about fire as a way of rebellion, of burning stuff down. Um, you see she chooses for a fire outside, that's where she eats in and, and this we read it to signify uh, going back to indigenous ways of eating rather than the colonial um, standards of how things should be done. Um, she also goes into, she critiques um, white Afrikaner feminists and the, the um, lineage that she writes into. She says, I feel fuckle for all white women who wrote pretty poems in 1960s American. I feel even less for one who wrote pretty poems during apartheid. My literary heroes do not win General Herzog prizes. I've never been anyone's noy or madam. My poems are not for a suffragette. My poems are for the aunties in the kitchen. My poems are for black and brown lighties. Um, 
in a class full of white children, I'm the daughter of the maid, and then she uses the derogatory, derogatory term for that in Afrikaans, and now I'm grown. I exchange my mother's ashes for gunpowder for the next generation so that they can be armed. You won't be able to shoot us in our backs again while we are running away in fear. Um, and, she's, and you can read that while I read my conclusion. Um, so we, in this article, we present the poetry of Ronaldo Comfort as a radical intersectional corrective to the tradition of white Afrikaans literary feminism. Comfort is writing in a language that became what it is today through her exclusion as brown person and subjugation as woman. She's not simply challenging its boundaries. She is subverting the very logic on, on which the precarious ordering system functions. Her work enacts the boundary loss that warns all systems of white supremacy. In this way, it carries radical emancipation potential, I would say, for all Afrikaans women, insofar as it cracks open a space in which feminist resistance becomes possible in a way that it does not in these structures of white supremacy, in a way that is precluded when white power as a system of heteronormative patrilineal remains intact. And that's it. Thanks. Let me stop sharing. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not quite sure what happened. Thank you so much, Azil. Um, thanks, that was really fascinating. I'm so much looking forward to um, unpacking a little bit more of that later on. Um, I am going to move, we're running about a minute behind, which is not too bad, but I'd like to introduce the next speaker. Thank you once again, Azil. Um, Kananelo Tswene. Um, the Multiplacedness of Home in Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Americana. Thank you, Kananelo. You're welcome to start whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to try to share my screen. Good. I don't know if you can see. Getting there. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you so much for your time. Um, so my paper is titled Content in a House, but always sitting by the window looking out. And it's a quote that comes from the book that I'm going to talk about. Um, so it, it is also titled um, The Multiplacedness of Home in Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's um, Americana. Okay, so in examining the love between protagonist Ifemelu and her three suitors in Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's Americana, I have come to the conclusion that love is political and love is didactic. Americana is not just a love story. The book serves as a question mark placed on fixed origins and the stability of the concept of home to, a di to diasporic subject Ifemelu. When the novel begins, Ifemelu characterizes towns and cities the way someone would characterize a human being. Not only does she suggest that Philadelphia held history in its gentle grasp, but she, su she suggests that Warrington is a somnolent town, a town contented with itself. Therefore, it is no surprise that I was immediately inspired to imagine some of the characters within the novel itself as representations of places in Ifemelu's diasporic journey. When examined closely, Femelu's romantic relationships take on a profound meaning when her suitors serve as geographical and cultural representations of her homeland and her diasporic home. Obinze, her childhood sweetheart, represents Nigeria, her country of origin, and Blaine and Kurt, who she is romantically linked to a while after Obinze, jointly represent the USA, her diasporic home. Bizarrely, a lot of Ifemelu's feelings, actions, and interactions with these men embody her diasporic journey in a suitable way. It is important to first note that home in this context will be defined as a place one feels a sense of belonging, regardless of whether or not this place is short-lived. A fixed or permanent home, however, is not short-lived and offers a perpetual sense of belonging. 
Geographically and romantically speaking, if Emelu moves between two countries and the three men and is exposed to what Taya Selassie, author of Ghana Must Go, coined as localities, these are rituals, relationships, restrictions that make a person a local in more than one place. As a result, if Emelu is not limited to her nation of origin, and in the alternative case, one man, which is Obinze. By not really staking claim to Nigeria or the USA as her permanent fixed homes, the novel points to the fact that the diasporic subject can be anchored to their homeland, but that does not guarantee that they will remain in it after returning. Although if Emelu experiences homesickness for her, home, for her homeland and alternatively displays more preference for Obinze as a love interest, social impediments and exclusions that come with the newly democratic Nigeria influence her perceptions of her homeland, just as she realizes upon her return that the Obinza she reunites with is not the Obinza that she remembers or she knew. This paper critiques and agrees with after Bra's theorization of the multi-placedness of home, which acknowledges that a diasporic subject can feel anchored to their homeland regardless of multi-placedness. This is important to note because the title of my paper contains the term which is coined by Bra, multi-placedness. It means the diasporic subject capacity to feel at home in more places than one. In this paper, I suggest that although Ifemelu is anchored to her homeland of Nigeria and to Obinza as a suitor, she does not stake permanent claim on the place of origin and the ending of the novel, which we will discuss more in detail as we go. Um, suggest that there is a possibility she does not stake permanent claim on Obinze either. Although the paper ultimately criticizes Obinze and Ifemelu's romance, which some might consider resilient and true, it aims to show us that through the power of choosing not to have a permanent home, in either the geographical or romantic sense, a woman can attain not only diasporic liberty, but freedom of choice in her relationships. And by that, I mean the freedom of choosing who to love, the freedom of choosing how she would like her relationships to be, and the freedom of choosing when to end a relationship if she wants to. So I thought first I would just say a little summary of what the book is about. Um, Americana is a building's romance centered around the life of protagonist Ifemelu, who is raised in Nigeria. She meets her childhood sweetheart in high school, Obinze, and moves to America for a tertiary education. And there she deals with matters of identity, race, class, and gender relations, while trying to forge a life for herself outside of her homeland. While outside of her homeland, however, she meets and is romantically involved with two other men, but ultimately leaves America and returns to Nigeria, where she reconnects with Obinze, her childhood sweetheart. A few disclaimers before I go as well. If Emelu experiences personal growth in various parts of her life for various reasons outside of the influence of men she is involved with, which I'm going to talk about. Um, so there's more to it. Um, although it may initially seem odd to use men as representations of her home and as, represent as the holders of her sense of belonging, as it defeats the purpose of a woman's liberty to some extent, it will be clear eventually when I finish um, that she has equal power as a woman. Lastly, this paper does not suggest that Ifemelu's intentions are inauthentic or villainous. It solely seeks to acknowledge her power and her adaptability in the situations she finds herself in. Okay, so localities. If Emelu's three relationships in Americana are culturally, economic, economically, and racially diverse, indicating that diasporas too are made up of many journeys and localities that are subject to their own particularities. If Emelu finds a home in three men as her experiences with them influence her identity. In a TED talk in 2014, Taya Selassie suggests that nations are imaginary and invented while cultures are real and a diasporic subject ought to be defined by cultures as opposed to the country of origin. So by dating two other men and by experiencing more than one culture, Ifemelu broadens her locality, which is marked by diverse experiences that are not limited to Nigeria as a homeland, or in this case, Obinze. Ifemelu is not just influenced by the USA generally, but specific cities like Baltimore, um, Manhattan, Philadelphia, etc., and is influenced by the culture of each city respect respectively. Um, romantically speaking, the diverse range of cultures and practices of Nigeria and America are effectively symbolized by the three men, rich in personality, who instead of just dating Ifemelu, each contribute to her identity as the places she visited have. 
if Emma Lou starts dating Kurt, a white American man from a financially and racially privileged background, unlike the other two men of a different race, Kurt's status as a white man sometimes opens up doors for Ifeme Lou as a black woman. Um, she mentioned that with him, she feels she felt like a pink balloon, weightless, floating to the top, propelled by things outside of herself. And through him, she gains job opportunities and, free, and um, his free spiritedness. Their relationship also inspires her to start her blog about race and African identity abroad. Her relationship with Blaine, however, who is a black man, is all about civic participation and intellect. Blaine is a university professor with an interest in the politics of blackness, described as, I quote, a man of careful disciplines. His strong controlling character encourages Ifemelu to write for cultural commentary instead of entertainment. A young Obinza, on the other hand, not only exposes Ifemelu to different kinds of culture, but convinces Ifemelu to apply to university in America. What is most interesting here um, that I found was that upon her return to Nigeria, Ifemelu has learned from her experiences with these men, more importantly and geographically and culturally speaking. We see how she has been influenced by various cultures upon her return to Nigeria. She describes Obinza to have lacked a certain strength his backbone was softened by duty. Although she ultimately returns to Nigeria, Ifemelu has experienced life in different places in America. Therefore, she is not able to see, she is now able to see Obinza's flaws, but her life as a national of, and her life as a national of Nigeria is forever altered. So physical and metaphorical borders. The concept of the diaspora is often linked to the idea of physical and metaphorical borders. In this novel, physical borders sep separating Nigeria and other countries can be seen as a metaphor for cultural, racial, and economic boundaries. Although she struggles, Ifemelu, as a diasporic subject, is able to overcome physical and metaphorical boundaries. Physical boundaries can be described as dividing lines that separate territories and hinder uncontrolled movement. Upon her arrival in America, Ifemelu is made aware of these borders, which make her as a foreigner, which make her a foreigner. When she attains a study visa, but does not have a visa to work and make a living. To overcome these issues, her aunt Uju helps her obtain a fake social security card. And although she struggles to find a job um, and finds herself in an unfavorable situation when she meets the tennis instructor or tennis coach, um, who pays her $100, $100 for her services. Um, Ifemelu overcomes this by landing a job as Kimberly's children's nanny. And later on in the novel, she, um, Kurt sets her up with a job interview in public relations in Baltimore. So alternatively and romantically speaking, borders will be defined as similarly a stumbling block that causes problems or doubt in a relationship before the relationship even begins. So regardless of hindrances that manifest before each of her relationships begin, if Emelu overcomes these hindrances and manages to maintain a long-term relationship with partners of different races, social statuses, and cultures, she meets Kurt, like I've already mentioned, who um, introduces her to her white friend and employer, Kimberly. From the outset, it is painfully obvious that Ifemelu's relationship with Kurt is doomed for failure. And this is marked by the way Ifemelu struggles to, re to fully repro reciprocate Kurt's feelings for her. Her reasons for involving herself with him are seemingly self-serving. She describes how Kurt would, and I quote, look at her in Wanda, his head slightly lowered and she felt an unfurling inside of her, how glorious it was to be wanted. And by this man with a rakish metal band with his wrist and the cleft chinned handsomeness of models in department store catalogs, she began to like him because he liked her. Her relationship with Blaine, however, who is of a different culture, skips several dating steps with her when they begin dating. And they decide to be together despite of the unknowns. And although they could see that it might end in failure, to make things worse, when she meets Blaine, they exchange numbers, but he neither calls her first nor returns her calls. And similarly, with Obinze, she gets involved with him while he's married, yet his wife should ideally be um, a metaphorical border that prohibits that um, involvement. 
These actions are ones that allow her to ignore the borders threatening her relationships or her progress. Ifemelu does not let economic, cultural, social, or racial, um, racial, metaphorical, and physical borders limit her in both America and Nigeria. And this allows for her to feel at home, both in the homeland and in her diasporic home. So the next slide is titled, yes? Sorry, you have just under, three minutes remaining. Okay. okay, so slide six is titled Decentering the Center. Um, the way in which Ifemelu if, if leaves her relationships shows the decentering of the center, which in this case means her capacity to balance the power in her relationships. So by ending relationships when she wants, Ifemelu brings herself to the center from the margins where some of the men in her relationships as well as society would place her traditionally. Ifemelu's um, actions show her freedom to not only let the men dictate the fate of her relationship, but she shows her ability to look past herself as a racial, economic, and cultural minority. This decentering of the center is seen through her return to her homeland from her diasporic home. So from, from America, Ifemelu voluntarily returns to Nigeria. Although she's not completely happy there, she leaves the diasporic home, which is the USA, for the home country, which is Nigeria, potentially indicating that perhaps Nigeria as a home country is seen by her as worthy of settlement, just as a diasporic home is. Um, and because um, the diasporic home is often seen as economically um, superior than the homeland. Um, so it kind of brings both countries to an almost equal level. And alternatively and romantically speaking, um, Curl, I mean, Kurt, who's the white man that she dates, cheats on her. And this makes Ifemelu feel, and I quote, small and ugly. Not long after Ifemelu cheats on Kurt with a younger man from her department building, suggesting that the reason was to create rough edges, to squash Kurt's sunniness even just a little. Moreover, Ifemelu ends her long relationship with Blaine, stating that she stayed even though she knew she had not been happy in the relationship for a long time. She states that her relationship with him was like, and I quote, content in a, being content in a house, but always looking out the window, um, always sitting by the window looking out. And then the third man, Obinze, Ifemelu first ends the relationship when she stops communicating with Obinze upon her arrival in America. And she also ends the relationship when she realizes that Obinze has plans to continue seeing her while married to Kosi. She tells him to go to hell and locks her door and tells him to leave. Ifemelu's long, longtime friend, Ginika, on the other hand, tells her that she thinks she is a self-sabotager. I think that Ginika is right by saying that. And the reason I say that is because um, Although self-sabotage is a negative behavioral trait, there is a protection of power in self-sabotage. And what I mean by that is that um, often when someone self-sabotages, they hold themselves back. But the reason that they hold themselves back is because there's a level of power over your own life that you are trying to preserve. So all of these three instances show, um, show us if Emily's power to control what she considers her home and how long her and to um, kind of control the time um, of her relationships or her diasporic journey. So more importantly, it seems that if Emelu desires complete power over her, over her multiple relationships, she seems to believe that belonging in Nigeria means um, the complete conquering of it. And that settling in America also means she has to conquer it too. And this is not realistic. However, if Emelu has multiple homes, she is bound to feel alienated in most of them or all of them. And um, she can be anchored to Nigeria as her homeland, but she is not um, permanently anchored to it um, compared to her diasporic homes. So lastly, just to end this really quickly, okay, um, there's a possibility. You. Oh, sorry. Sorry, you're just, you're out of time, but I'll, you can go ahead and finish up. I'll give you one okay. last minute before I start waving. Okay, okay. Finally, there's a possibility that Obinza and Ifemelu would not live happily ever after. And alternatively, Nigeria could possibly not serve as Ifemelu's permanent home. As mentioned before, Ifemelu's identity has been transformed by her account encounters in her diasporic home. Although there is a finality to Ifemelu's last words to Obinze, which say, come in, the longevity of their relationship is still not guaranteed. In the novel, Ifemelu and Obinze watch the male peacock standing as if looking down at his own kingdom in the company of two female peacocks. Obinze is representative of the male Peacock in the company of both Ifemelu and Kosi. However, before the book ends, um, a lot has changed and Ifemelu watches the less powerful male peacock dance and fan out his halo for the female peacock who instead walks away indifferent to it. Perhaps the female peacock that leaves the male peacock will be representative of, of Ifemelu when the when the ex, when the wife Kosi leaves Obinze. Perhaps now that Kosi and Obinze's relationship has ended and Ifemelu starts seeing Obinze 
if Emily might realize how unexciting his feathers are, or in this case, companionship, and she'll walk away. When the novel ends, Obinza repeats a phrase he tells of Femelu early in the novel, I'm chasing you, which suggests that perhaps if Emily always and will continue to always be in search for something or someone beyond Obinze. Um, so this is not as bad as you think. In the end, she's no longer just Nigerian Ifemelu, but an almost um, cosmopolitan Ifemelu who is not tied down by just one fixed home. Yeah. Thank you so much, Kananelo. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, very much looking forward to chatting more afterwards. And um, lastly, on this afternoon's panel, we have Gayatri Aich. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, and, right. and Gayatri's the title of, of, of her paper is Women of Color, Body Politics and Identity in Girls, Women and Other. And as with the other two, I'll just keep time to 15 minutes and kind of um, flag the last two minutes or so. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to check if I'm audible. Yes. You are. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, good. Okay. Taking looks at Bernadine Everisto's portrayal of Black women's identity in Girl, Woman, Other. Her interconnected stories of British Black women whose lives are entirely different from one another in terms of their backgrounds, experiences, and choices raise questions about race, gender, sexuality, framing the bigger question of one's identity. There are multiple narratives in the novel each shaped by the events in the lives of these women, voices that talk about patriarchy, domestic violence, politics, and colorism as they come to understand throughout their lives. Everisto in this novel binds together women of color across generations, social classes, and faiths, and portrays their unique and individual identities through their bodies. It can be argued that each identity is shaped by and reflected in the clothes and accessories that a woman chooses to wear from how she ties up her hair to how she feels about her body. The women's bodies become representations of different identities and they choose to embody certain motives. In Girl, Woman, Other, the details such as a sequent hijab, the hoop earrings, the hair gelled down and parted or the navy blue trousers paired up with a white shirt are all significant because they reflect the very politics of the relation between clothing and fashion and identity, social, cultural, and gender. The racial, gendered, and sexual identities of women are highly influenced by what society wants them to be, how it expects them to talk, how it tells them to dress and behave, how it distinguishes who a good woman and a bad woman are based on these very basic and everyday characteristics. This paper focuses on identity shaped by clothing and fashion and how it is linked to the consciousness of the women in Everisto's novel. Everyday events affect a person's consciousness, which tends to leave a long lasting impression on what becomes the default thought process of that person's mind. When we look at the lives of each of the women in the text, there is a distinct pattern that shapes them. Each young girl is inspired by an independent woman each young girl wants to present herself in certain ways that are acceptable or rather appreciable in the society. There is a constant pressure on the minds of young women to be able to look beautiful in terms of what she puts on and what she confidently walks in, even if it is not the kind of clothing that she feels comfortable in. For instance, Kamla Das from India in her confessional poem and introduction speaks about the psyche of women from childhood as a lover, as a wife, a voice against exploitation, each role constituting different demands and a different perspective of the people around her. However, there are women mostly older, experienced, and those who have been through a lot of changes in their personal as well as public lives, who are confident in what they wear and who do not live by the rules of the society's description or standards of what beauty stands for. The section on Amma in the first chapter of the novel is about a woman who is a queer theater director in Britain. Here, Amma reflects upon her struggles as a young black actress 
and the challenges she had faced while creating her own theater company. Amma is also seen introspecting about the surprising turn of events in her life with the birth of her daughter, Yaz, who has just begun college. Year round, her peroxide dreadlocks are trained to stick up like candles on a birthday cake. Silver hoop earrings, chunky African bangles, and pink lipstick are her perennial signature style statement. This section of the novel describes how Amma chooses to dress up. Everisto talks about how the traditional theater industry in Britain through several years had looked down on actresses on the basis of the color of their skin and the clothes and accessories that they chose to wear. As her own daughter puts it, the mad old woman look is also how the society has described women of color who choose to wear what expresses their personality. The natural hairdos of black women are considered to be inappropriate or funny by the racist society. M Emma Dabiri in Don't Touch My Hair argues, and I quote, that the desire to conform to the European aesthetic which values light skin and straight hair is a result of a propaganda campaign that has lasted more than 500 years. It is the imposition of a system that denigrates anything that is perceived as too African, unquote. The mad old woman look is a stereotypical identification of women of color, which leads to the fear of ignominy and otherization, thus forcing these women to hide their true selves down to something as basic as their hair. No matter how confident and opinionated Yaz as a young woman and daughter is, she refuses to be spotted alongside her mother because of the way her mother dresses. To her daughter, Amma is not a normal mother, because of her patterned harem pants that end just below the knee, or the bright asymmetric shirts, jumpers, jackets, and coats. What defines normal here is perhaps how the white society defines how Black women should be presenting themselves in the streets or in the society. For women like Amma, to wear chunky African bangles is a way to hold on to their cultural identity. When a woman of color specifically wears clothes, and accessories that are not considered to be fit for a society that calls itself multicultural and yet is racist, she chooses to hold on to something that forms a collective identity and reclaim her ethnic pride. Ornaments play a significant role in cultural communities across the world. There are various bangles, anklets, bracelets, and necklaces that are made of different materials such as copper, brass, gold, brass, or even beads, which have symbolic values and importance within various communities across the world. There is a specific kind of Shauna spirit medium, which is also known as the Vadzimu, apologies, apologies if I'm pronouncing it uh, wrongly. And it can be identified with certain kinds of bangles made of gold, copper, and brass, known as the Nadrira. It is important to note that these symbolic meanings not only differ across communities, but also may vary when these are being received by British black women at various points of time in history. The significance of the chunky African bangles that Amma wears is that of an identity that she wants to hold on to. Her individual identity of a black woman and that of a larger community, cultural, social, and perhaps even religious. In the second section called Yaz, in the first chapter of the novel, we are introduced to a young woman named Boris, a Sudanese Muslim woman of color, and we look at what the hijab means to her. I quote, Waris matches her headscarves with the color of her flowing clothes. She has green days, brown days, blue days, floral days, fluorescent days, never black days. She's not a traditionalist. She often sticks her phone just inside her hijab to carry out hands-free conversations, which Yas tells her is an excellent blend of religiosity and practicality to which Waris replies that she wears a hijab to make a statement about her Muslim identity, unquote. The Muslim veil or the hijab has been a matter of debate for quite a long time in the modern day society. When a Muslim woman wears a hijab or the headscarf, what is explored on a daily basis with, within communities across nations is the intersection between private religious practice and its social expression in public places. Suad Abdul Khabir writes in her article, 
Hujjavis and Muslim dandies, how fashion intersects with race, gender, class, and Muslim identity, about a particular headscarf style used by Black Muslim women in the United States, and I quote, a scarf tied in a bun at the back of a woman's head that is also tied up in the complexities of race and class in the United States, unquote. For Waris, the politics behind wearing a hijab is that of exertion of her Muslim identity. She also refuses to call herself a traditionalist and does not wear black clothing or a black hijab. Waris, being a Sudanese Muslim woman, challenges the stereotypes within the Muslim community and outside. The reason she wears a hijab is to confront the Islamophobic society that demonizes Muslims and how they perceive every Muslim person from their way of clothing to label them as threatening or terrorizing. The politics of Waris wearing a hijab and that too of various colors and patterns questions the discriminatory behavior towards black Muslim women. The third chapter, the, the, the third section of chapter two revolves around the life of Latisha Kanisha Jones. This paper will focus on what the uniform means to Latisha and several other women like her and how the suit wearing woman is basically planning, uh, playing a pre-existing role in the society. Latisha is wearing, and I quote, her uniform of navy blue trousers with a crease down the front, navy blue cardigan, fresh white shirt, hair gelled down and side parted, very smart and professional because that's what she is now. After she crawled her way out of the horror movie of her teenage years to begin climbing the giddy heights of retail supremacy, unquote. The oppression that young black teenage girls face is intensified because of the intersections of gender, race, and sexuality that further makes it a challenge for them to weave an identity that defines them as not only an ethnic or cultural community, but also independent individual human beings. When we look at Latisha or Yaz or Waris, what is common to all of them is the way they struggle to fight discrimination, racial and gendered, while all of it is shaping their identities. There are other important factors that come into play while shaping a young girl's identity, such as personal relationships, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, as well as political ideologies or beliefs. Latisha, as a young woman who now works at a grocery store, knows that her uniform makes her look smart, professional, and presentable the same, to the same society that had looked down upon her during her teenage years because of the way she dressed or the way she presented herself, which included a clingy, spangled dress and strappy heels when she had to go on a date. Not having a clear understanding of social constructs, young girls usually wear what they think is presentable and attractive, like in the first section of the second chapter. Carol, a friend of Letitia's, feels about her sense in clothing and fashion. On the occasion of a party, Carol was extremely happy and relieved about the fact that Letitia has had forced her to dress up. Carol was, was also hoping that the lipstick would not rub off her lips, the lipstick that she was wearing for the first time. Now the lipstick, the dresses, or the high heels here are signifiers of a diva personality. They also have some amount of purchasing power which results in these accessories, not just reflecting Carol's or Latisha's sense or taste in fashion, but also in certain ways, their social and economic backgrounds. The role of a diva uh, is a pre-existing role in society which a large number of girls in their teenage years look up to and crave to be take up, uh, crave to be able to take up. Latisha now wears a uniform which includes navy blue trousers and a fresh white shirt and has her hair gelled down and side parted. Her uniform does not allow her to wear her natural hair. And she has internalized the fact that she looks professional and smart only when her hair is parted in a manner that does not come to her naturally. However, however different Carol's and Letitia's lives may have turned out to be, what is common about the two of them is how they have come to accept the established practices of capitalism in terms of how they dress for work. Kayachi, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. You have just under two minutes. Okay. It is not just hair when it comes to black identities. 
the reason latisha feels more presentable without her natural hair or the reason yas feels that her natural hair would be problematic for the child sitting behind her in the classroom or the person sitting behind her in a theater audience is because of the stares and the laughter that these women have experienced as young children a news article published on 18th of november 2019 talks about some very recent cases of discrimination against women of color who wear their natural hair ruby williams an 18 year old girl was 14 years old when she was told by her school that her hair breached the policy of the orswick school in east london which stated afro hair must be of reasonable size and length The third chapter of the novel begins with the section called Shirley who has a who is a history teacher at the Peckham School for Boys and Girls. When we talk about a woman who belongs to the black community dressing up and styling herself there is a certain kind of communication of ideas and self respect cultural appreciation and community pride. Further clothing and fashion has played a major role in shaping and reflecting the individual identities and the lives of morgan or megan as she used to be called before and bb in the fourth chapter megan describes how her mother unknowingly repeats the patterns of gender oppression on her the adults in megan's life who are part of the conservative generation attempt to fit megan into society's gender norms megan's preference of wearing trousers instead of dresses as a young child was not acceptable in her family Megan had always been confused about her sexual identity. Most young teenagers have nobody to talk to about their choices of clothing are related to how they feel about their bodies that they are born in. And it I is in fact yeah. Sorry, your time your time is up. Um I can uh, I can give you a, a few seconds to just wrap up but we have to finish otherwise we'll have no time to I'll just uh, wrap it up. Sorry. Thank you. Each woman in Everisto's novel has her own choice of dressing and each of them represents a certain set of common concerns or dialogues in the black community. There are various body image issues associated with consciousness of women of color, racial, microaggression, aggressions or ignorance, hypersexualization, sacrifice or unacceptability of natural hair and the validation and invalidation given by others. performance of identity for black women involves a certain creating a certain kind of balance between what their private or cultural identity is and what would be best suited for their public or social identity which leaves a huge impression on their work life um that will be all thank you so much thank you thank you so much okay thanks gayatri and thank you to all three our presenters um I don't know if you want to put your mics on so that it feels a little bit um more like a conversation. Um I are, are there any um questions or comments? Um have we lost Oh okay there's Cananello. Um and Keaton says very interesting presentations indeed very interesting. Um if there are no um immediate questions then i we have about we only have about 7 minutes remaining so i'll jump in and ask each of you something um thank you so much for those really thought provoking and wonderful presentations um i have um i feel like i have too much to say which is i suppose always the case with these um with these experiences um so okay I firstly I was quite taken by how nicely these papers work together. It's it's not it's not always the case as you all obviously know, but I thought that there were such interesting points of connection um and um th that's not really the the train of thought I was to follow, but I just wanted to say that to the three of you. Um but Azil, I uh I was really intrigued by you know this this idea of um Ronaldo's Ronaldo Comfer's poetry right and how you you you're clearly making this link between what she's doing with kind of carps or even um you know I suppose in an older uh to use an older kind of linguistic uh, formulation um 
which you also used, which is kumbes Afrikaans, right? But I mean, really more cups, right? Which is Afrikaans spoken um, by people of color in the in the Western Cape. And I, I thought that that was really interesting, but I was, I was wanting you to say a little bit more about how you see her work as in, it could, the way I understood the paper was that you're speaking about her poetry almost as though it is in response to white Africana dom, right? Or white Africana hood. Um, and I wondered a lot about how she seemed so alone or her work seemed so alone, right? Whereas I immediately thought of um, uh, older poets even, you know, people like um, Habiba Badarun, Diane um, Pierce, um, and others, but just as you were speaking, I was just kind of making notes and I thought about how this forms part of an ongoing body of poetry by a woman of color or black woman poets about histories of being woman, being black, using Afrikaans or using language or using, using the kind of cultural tools um, that are not prescribed by whiteness. So I found it a kind of an interesting angle and I, I wanted you to say a little bit more about that or if I misunderstood you to also say you, you've got it wrong, you know. Um, so that, that was kind of what I was thinking, thinking about listening to you. Um, there are other things also, but I can't say that now. And then um, Cananello, um, I wanted to know, you You ended with um, speaking about cosmopolitanism and Ifemelu as, you know, as she becomes this kind of cosmopolitan citizen. She is, uh, her multiple identities don't feel so foreign or as fraught, right? And so I wondered if you felt, um, my question is, how do you see Ifemelu's cosmopolitanism as important to how she's able to make sense of her multiple identities? Do you, do you almost, it's an unfair question a little bit, but do you feel like uh, the, the cosmopolitanism almost equates a kind of personal acceptance or is it an acceptance by this new home, the new home space? Um, so yeah, I wanted you to say a little bit more about the protagonist's cosmopolitanism and how that helps her feel that she can hold these multiple identities and hold this kind of these multiple trans um, national experiences and call multiple places home, right? And then um, Gayatri, finally, um, I, 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 I was really kind of touched by how you tried to weave together, you know, quite a a lot right in this in this narrative because all these women carry their own stories um and and so i you know the, the 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 one thing that kind of kept coming up for me was this historical relationship between um black identities in their multitude you know mul how do you say that multitude of ways um and notions of respectability and how much of that is ingrained in, um, in practices of beauty. And what came up for me was Elaine Salo's work on, uh, it's an Afrikaans term called, uh, it's authenticate, and it basically means, you know, um, being respectable, like proper, and that filters into everything. So looking respectable, presenting yourself as respectable says something about who you are. Right. And uh, I mean, as you were raising, as you were kind of speaking to each character and what the what the trait was, what the beauty trait was, um, you know, the, 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 the common the, the common themes, of course, hair, um, hair practices, you know, among black women, accessories and, and obviously clothing um, also came up for me uh, uh, quite strongly. Um, and, and yeah, I was just really taken by um, the ways in which this notion of self-styling comes up so strongly and this relationship between self-styling and being or becoming a diva. And I guess I just want to do, I, I just wanted you to say a little bit more about, um, 
about how that kind of plays out in the rest of, in the rest of the, the novel. And I know it's about many different women's stories, so you might not be able to answer that in a kind of all-encompassing way. Um, yeah, but those are my my questions to each of you. We have no time left, but I'd like to give you each at least a minute to say something. Oh, and Anne has a question. Um, okay, I'm going to read Anne's question, which is to Gayatri very quickly. Kindly comment on the style of writing in Girl, Woman, Other, and does it in any way influence identities of the different characters in the novel? And in the interest of time, please feel free to either answer Anne or me. I, yeah, really don't mind. Okay, Azil, would you like to go for it? Okay, thanks for those nice questions, Dee. Um, so I think um, Bibi would be able to answer this question better because she's the literary scholar. But as far as I know, Renata Comfort is really um, or was alone in the canon for a very long time. She's the first woman poet who is not white, who is published in... So I, as I understand, Diane Ferris self-published. Um, so, and then um, afterwards, now after Ronaldo has published, we have seen other poets like Jolyn Phillips, like Lynthia Julius, like um, Ryan Pedro, Nathan Tontral, all oh, these are my, those are men. But uh, the point is that for a long time, she was quite, and the reason why I put her against whiteness is because she's, so the, the language itself we know is not white. It was, co it was um, taken for the, um, and co-opted for the process of, or the project of white nationalism, but the literary canon as it exists in, in Afrikaans with the machinery of publication, that comes from this formal Afrikaans that is really linked to this project of whiteness. And it is in this canon that Ronaldo is writing in. So um, she has published in, um, I think, who was it? But there was a Our Words, Our Worlds, Our Worlds, Our Words, um, a compilation of poetry published, um, I think last year or beginning of this year. And there she was included with many other um, South African women poets of color, but they, the, most of them are English. And I was at one of these launches and she said, it's so nice to be included in the space where she's not one of the only people who is not white at these super white literary events. So um, in a sense, in the institutionalized literary space, she has been quite alone for a while and it's changing now. And those are the doors that she's opening, but this is really how, um yeah bad uh, or problematic the space is so um cool. yeah that's how i can answer <laughs> thank you Azil. thank you um Kananello, before you go there's a question for you and again i'll you know feel free to answer either one do you think uh, this is from moketsi um, do you think ephemeral's uh story is an example of how migrants are constantly negotiating and wrestling with the idea of home, where they feel both foreign in the original home country, hence leaving it for hence leaving it and foreign, and then in brackets in their new adopted home, as said by the poem of Ijvoma uh, Ume Binyu. Thank you. Um, thank you for that for those questions. I'll try to answer as quickly as I can. You asked me about um, personal acceptance, if she feels any sense of personal acceptance. And I don't get that from her. And I think that's why she was such an interesting um, person to, to assess. Um, I think she still very strongly believes that Nigeria is where she's supposed to be. And just through my own interpretation, um, I had the feeling that it wasn't. And um, alternatively, I felt as if she also believed that Obinze was her soulmate or the man that she's going to always stay with. And there are a lot of instances in their past that suggest that this relationship is quite unstable, that it might not last. And similarly, um, her relationship with Nigeria, because she doesn't feel at home, it also suggests that she might not really stay there. So um, I don't think that she has accepted it fully. Um, I think she's still grappling with it in a way. Um, so I think there is a chance that she will become a fully fledged cosmopolitan woman once she decides to see more of the world. So that's just kind of the, 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 the impression I got from the ending, which I thought was quite 
indeterminate in a way when he, she says come in it doesn't really suggest what she means and what's going to happen after that and that's why I found it so interesting um, that's to answer the first question and then for the question in the chat my answer for that is yes absolutely um, I mentioned it while I was talking as well I do think that she's a great example of of, of of how migrants negotiate that idea of home. And for me, it was very personal as well because um, I thought it was quite relatable. Um, I mentioned that I felt as if she was trying to conquer both her homeland and her diasporic home at the same time, if that makes any sense. Or when she visits her um, homeland, she wanted to conquer her homeland in a way that she wanted to be a, a, a like a fully, what would be considered like a, a proper Nigerian, you know, she wanted to fully um, kind of adapt into that kind of society. And she also wanted to adapt into um, her diasporic home as well. And I thought that was unrealistic. You can't really expect to um, fit in in both places um, whenever you feel like you want to. So yeah, I definitely think that um, it's an example of, of, of that kind of struggle between yeah, between your diasporic home as well as um, your homeland that everyone, I think, almost everybody experiences. So yeah, thank you for that question. Thank you. Thanks, Kananelo. Gayatri, would you like to go for it? We uh, do have yeah. maybe two, three minutes, so you're welcome to, to answer both if you wish. Thank you. Um, so to first answer your question, um, it's actually difficult too because there are a lot of characters weaved uh, and their stories uh, taken together. But I think uh, what's very similar and common among all of them is the fact that uh, their personal and professional relationships, their private and public lives is what um, kind of changes how they look at their identities and how they are supposed to present themselves. So it's always about the connections at home and the connections outside that uh, sort of uh, influences how somebody really young, somebody in their teen years uh, is thinking of, uh, of what a diva personality, of, of what it is exactly that defines beauty and what they are supposed to look like. Um, and um, also similar to uh, Kananello's uh, response to one of the questions, it's also about the, you know, the, the fully Nigerian identity or the fully black identity. Uh, there's this uh, completeness that uh, sometimes uh, somebody may not be able to um, represent in certain ways, uh, but then that differs from one person to another on how they look at what you call being completely black because there is nothing that defines it, it's very varied and it's very different uh, from different people's perspectives on what defines identity for them uh, to answer the question in the chat box uh, i think yes the 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 narrative structure and the style of writing uh, definitely uh, uh, has an effect on the, how we how we can look into the psyche and the thinking process of the characters in the novel because um, the the lack of uh, punctuations the lack of uh, you know the, the, the there's this very um, smooth flow of words smooth flow of the thought processes is how the style of writing has been represented which kind of uh, I think uh, defines how we actually think when we are thinking about uh, our personal and public lives and how we look at ourselves because it's never something that goes in a straight line it's always there are curves that are uh, uh, it just gets uh, dissected I think uh, again and again so yeah I think that that is how I would like to answer the question wonderful thank you all three of you once again and thank you um to all of you who have listened in and watched and been part of the um, uh, the session here today. Um, yeah, Anne Keaton says thank you for that. Um, yeah, if there are any other final comments, you're welcome to pop them in the chat now. Um, but thank you once again to all three of you for your really wonderful presentations um, and enjoy the rest of the conference, everyone. <laughs> okay, thanks.